So first I have a spoiler alert. Uh, this talk is much about John Le Carré, uh book, The Tinker, Tailor, Soldier, Spy, as the Bourne movies are based on the Robert Lundlum movie. So don't get too excited about like spy movies and everything. Um, but before I go into the content of our talk, let me tell a little story. Um, the gentleman on the right there is Captain Medeiros from the Brazilian Air Force. This is like 1973, maybe. And this is Sergeant Maya. He's like um, uh, best pal in the Air Force. And yes, this is my dad. He, and his job for the Air Force is in the Corps of Engineers. He's building these airports in the middle of nowhere. We're talking about like somewhere down in the Amazon. You're just like tearing down the trees so that you, that you can build progress in the middle of nowhere. Um, and all, I mean, this is not Photoshop. This is actually fungus that, I mean, that my sister sent me these slides a couple weeks ago. Half of them got stopped at the German customs. I think they saw that this was like some biological agent. So, um, but yeah, this is very old stuff. So his job is to build things like this. This is the airport of Tabachinga which is a city that's two hours flight from Berlin, which is eight hours flight from here. So you can imagine that it's like really far. Um, so he tears down the, the trees so that you can actually connect, let's say air, like planes can connect to the city of Tabachinga. And you might be asking yourself, why the hell would someone want to build an airport there? Well. If, if Tabachinga doesn't have an airport, then anybody who have a problem, let's say a broken leg or someone needs a surgery, needs to put on the ship and then spend four days on a river. As you can see, the city is nearby the river there. Spends four days to get to Belém, which is the nearest capital with any kind of infrastructure. Um, so this is the kind of conditions that my dad would, would work on. A, this is a day in the office. Like he doesn't have energy. There is no uh, running water and everything, so he has to bring the infrastructure with him when he's building these airports. Um, and there's a lot of improvisation. I don't know if you can notice, there's like a bulldozer, actually not bulldozing anything, but just helping as support to the, to the machine over there. So there's a lot of improvisation going on in these places. Um, this is a stand-up meeting at, on, on the Air Force. Not because th this is like we're trying to make the meeting quick, it's just that there are no chairs, so you have to stand up. Um, and there will be all kinds of roadblocks in a project like this. For example, we cannot build anything because the, the, the power generator, the roof just collapsed. Or, or I don't know, uh, there's a cougar eating our people here, so we have to stop whatever we're doing kill the cougar, then we can go back to, to actually build the airport. So the, the gentleman on the right is Brigadier Major Ottomar, which is my dad's superior, like three pay grades above. This gentleman would travel with my father every, I don't know, six months to go around checking if the airports are being built. So it's more like a product demo of the airports, right? Like you're seeing if the airport is working for the first time. The idea is like my dad needs to make sure that the airports are, are working and everything is fine before Major Brigadier Otomar shows up. And I guess you all feel like you understand this pressure. Not that you're building airports, but you know that, let's say, something like things needs to be working before the product owner shows up. Um, and I don't have these slides because, like I said, the German customs kept some of them. Uh, but the one story that I remember re very vividly is that the, the Amazon rivers, the difference between the highest level of water and in the, let's say, summer and then, well, actually winter and then, and then summer could be up 30 meters, let's say, the flood season and then the, the low season. And then, let's say, all your, your planning needs to be around making sure that the supplies and everything gets shipped because guess what, there's no airport yet there, so you have to make sure they get by boat on the, on the season that the tide is high so that they don't get stuck. 
in one of the many mishaps when you have distributed teams, you, one of the, your vendors decides, let's, yeah, there's still two days before we get, we get to the low tide season. Let's ship it anyway. And then all of a sudden, there's 600 tons of cement stuck on the river because like, somebody decided to go over the boat there's two, two, the boat there's two rows. So my, my father goes and talks to Major Brigadier uh, Otto Meyer and says, listen, uh, one of our boats got stuck on the river. Um, can we work it out? Let's say you send another boat, a smaller one, and we move things from one to the other, and then we can get the project going. And then in a very typical military uh, way of handling problems, M Major Brigadier Otomar says, just make it happen. You know, it's like, just go for it. Sorry, I'm not going to send you any boats. You just go figure it out. My dad, being very resourceful, says, let's pack everything, stop whatever we're doing in the airport, put people on a boat, and actually go dig the boat out of the river. <laughs> I mean, so it's like, that's the way that you're going to make um, things work at that time. The lesson that I learned, I mean, from all these mishaps is, and you might be questioning, it's like, well, most of these projects were always on time. I mean, I, I don't know about infrastructure problems. Like, some people keep telling me that some roads spent 40 years being built somewhere and, and everything. But at some of these infrastructure projects, or at least you think about regular, traditional, maybe not so major scale projects, they do get delivered on time, and the budget is always like pretty reasonable, sometimes actually on budget. So there's, I mean, and you'll be wondering why. And my dad, in a very, let's say, I, I remember going to one of these, but that's the only time I would actually see him because um, he's spending like, he, he's not building one airport, he's building 40 airports at the same time. So I don't get to see him much. So the only time I, I spend with him is, is like visiting these, these construction sites. Right, it's not like I spend a lot of quality time with my dad. But I'm not bitter, I'm not bitter. Um, the only time I spend is like, let's, the, I cannot have talks about soccer or about, let's say, the meaning of life. I'm having like, why did it take so long to build these airports and blah, blah. And one, I remember one, this one conversation that I had with my dad, that says like, dad, why don't these things all fall apart? I mean, how can, how can this roof doesn't fall on the top of my head? And then my dad in a very, like, very, a child psychology sound approach, he said, well, because as an engineer, you have to over budget everything by 300%. You know, it's like you put 300% more uh, weight on it and, and time and everything you overestimate, um, which is a lesson for us, right? Let's say next time you, you go do your sprint planning, just put 300% there and you should be okay. Um, <laughs> as if it's ever gonna happen, right? But um, the one thing that I, I, I that actually, I, I remember that conversation because it took, with, I mean, I, I've been experiencing kind of the reverse, let's say. My projects are never that technically complicated. It's not like I have to deal with snakes or, or cougars eating the part of the team members. Although there are some team members, like, I, I mean, some, sorry, I cannot work today because uh, I have a back problem and then I see her push, posting pictures of Florence and, on Flickr, and then it's like, forgot that I'm her friend in Flickr, and then, yeah. but anyway. The technicalities of the, some of the problems are not that technically complicated, yet why we go through all this angst of, of, of finishing projects in a distributed manner? Well, basically, I mean, this is something that stuck with me, right? Let's say uh, that, that conversation had about that, but 40 years later, here we are, I, I think uh, I, in the introduction says like I spent a couple of years in China. The, the time I had in China was very eye-opening in terms of, let's say, being in the other side of the coin. Well, I think a lot of people that do work in distributed teams in this room feel the same way. It's like you're the one getting instructions from Captain Medeiros or you're the one getting instructions from Major Brigadier Otomar. Well, not with these titles, but someone in the authority figure saying, hey, like, we need to make this happen. How can we get this to work and everything? So China was a very good experience in, in, in terms of making, opening my eyes to that. That's my wife, and, and this is Shanghai in the background. This is only four years ago, but 
the, the, land, the landscape looks completely different. Like they tear down things and up and put things up very quick. That time was very, um, was very good for me to learn about the, the very good socialist values of China. Um, but I mean, after that I moved on. So the, the current experience I'm having is like I'm working in this, in this company in Germany, like, like was mentioned in the introduction. And I got to work on other projects now, more like in the Middle East. So I do get, I, I do get to see a lot of culture differences, which I think as, an, as a designer, if, if you think that the project you're going on through right now is like too painful because you have to deal with all these people like in US or in Brazil or in China, well, think from the positive side. There's always, as a designer, there's always a, a, something, a lesson that you can draw in terms of empathy and cultural awareness, which is something we're going to be talking about it soon. Um, but basically, um, I don't think I'm unique in this experience. I think most of you here, to some degree, are experiencing that, which is the fact that the world is flat, right? At least it's perceived as flat. The, and just to share a little bit of my experience, these are just the last three companies I worked for. So, like, um, sometimes you're you have, you're lucky to have, let's say, here's your, where you're working, and the headquarters is is just one hour away. But then there's another one 12 hours away. Um, when you get in very different time zones, that's when things get really complicated, right? So, which, based on what I heard since I got here, is a lot of people are struggling with that. So we're going to cover that pretty quick. Um, the problem was like, and I don't know, I don't know what's your background, but I noticed that a lot of companies let's say, oh, let's put all these teams distributed because communication is cheap, right? So this is, I don't know how good the picture looks like from the background there. This is my daughter and this is my son. And, we, and I'm here in the conference and I, that's the only way I can read stories for them before they go to bed is, is, is FaceTime, which is a godsend uh, technology. Um, there is this impression that because, let's say, oh, phone calls don't cost as much as they used to, or because there's Skype or Google hang, Hangout, that it's okay to have these teams distributed, we just make it happen, right? So at least that's, it's, at least it's like maybe that's not how the organizations are, are strategically setting things up. It's just, it, at least this is like, maybe that's a subconscious thing that is happening. It's like, let's, let's make it, let's say, as long as we have people that are talented enough, they go figure it out because communication is cheap. The problem with, with that kind of arrangement is that they, they tend to forget that the cost of collaboration is actually very underestimated. So my dad used to overestimate everything by 300% in terms of cost and time. I don't think we are doing that when it comes to the actual collaboration aspect. So this is my son visiting the office the first time. And the first thing he does is sit on the computer, get the mouse, and start checking Facebook, which I don't think he should be doing. But, um, but I don't know about you, but every now and then I get these spam emails in my inbox. It's like, hi, my name is Thomas Anderson, and I'm a, a, I'm a developer in, in, in Chennai, and I could help you with your, your website or create an app for you. And, I'm, I'm, and then I'm thinking, it's like, how many Thomas Anderson, like the Matrix Thomas Anderson, could actually be living in Chennai? Just me, I don't know about you, but. The thing is, like, the, the, the fact that there's, there's internet and there's, like, this perception of the world is flat, that's why you get, that, that's how you even get emails like this. It's like, there's this impression that just because I can do for you cheap, that I should be doing for you cheap. You know, it's like, cheap in sense of the ultimate cost might make sense to a lot of companies, but they tend to forget this, this overestimate, like, the cost of collaboration. So let me go through a couple of, of myths that I think that is happening. Why these projects, why there's so much anxiety um, when, it, when it comes to delivering these projects that, um, distributed. I, and uh, just to share a, a little bit of context of what, what this has happened, like why, why am I getting these myths up in front of you? Is this that I've worked with many designers before. When I, when I was in China, I had to set up a team of 12 de designers. But I had to interview like 100 to get these people there. And I noticed there are some trends, like even on my team, but also on the teams that work with, with them, it's like there's, there are some myths about 
why projects don't get delivered efficiently or why there's so much anxiety when it comes to uh, working distributed. The first, the first one is like what I call the tinker, which is if I had this one tool, things would be easier. You know what I mean? And, and the funny thing is like the tool changes over time, let's say. Uh, anybody remembers front page? There's still anybody that used front page? Yeah, okay, good. I, I thought I was going to be alone. It's like, friend, what? Um, but at every semester, every year, every quarter, there's always a new tool for you to, for people to say, yeah, if we only use this, then our problems will be solved. Um, nothing against these tools. Some of these tools are actually pretty good. I actually use one of them, like most of them. The next myth is the Taylor myth, which is things are not working because uh, we are too political. We, we care too much about how people dress and, and the gossip in the office. If people, would, if people would just listen to me, things would work. And then name, right? Product manager, the development manager, anybody, your mom, like your mom doesn't listen to you, that's, that's what the problem is. And the, and the thing is, is like taken at a personal level, that's basically the, whole, the problems of everybody, right? Let's say you go to Christmas party at home, and most of the times they're like, I don't know why these people are going through all these issues. Like, if you just listen to me, you know, like, you need to shave, you need to take a shower, you need to stop beating at Molly, you probably need to start drinking. You know, it's like, that, there's all, like, we are very easy, we jump very quickly to come from the assumptions, like, if we were given the attention, we will fix everybody's problems, right? And we're going to go in details about this. The, 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 the third myth that I, I noticed that a lot of designers struggle with is the soldier myth. It's like, our organization, like we're not effective because our organization is just messed up. If we just run on, let's say, CMMI, isn't it the same thing. There's always a new process for us to try out there, like XP or Scrum or Kanban. Or ITIL or Lean, and if you're wondering, is Dungeons and Dragons an actual uh, methodology? Well, not yet. Uh, I'm actually I'm casting out this vision of we having a new uh, development process, Dungeons and Dragons. You know, like we could have the Rangers being the software developers and the Scrum master being the dungeon master. You know, like we, <laughs> if if we're gonna screw up with the the, the project, at least we're having fun while we, we're doing it. So you heard it here first. So. Which brings me to the last myth, which is the spy myth, which is if people would only read my specs or if people would only read the use case documents that I write. And basically, it's the same thing as like, I, I call this a spy myth because my wife used to work on the embassy, the Brazilian embassy, sorry, the Brazilian consulate in Shanghai. And every day there's just tons of cables that just inundate the, the, the consulate of things that are happening everywhere, right? And guess what? Until someone leaks on WikiLeaks, nobody even cares about what these, these cables are doing. Like, only, people only care about these cables when somebody leaks them. But most of the times it's like, who's reading all this crap? You know, so, and I, I, what I'm gonna try to do now is like make sure that, First, you understand that like, the problem is not that people are not reading your specs, right? So that, that's the one thing I, I, I hope it gets clear. So let's go over each of these myths. The, the tinker myth, right, is, is all about the tools. The process myth, which is like, if we just run better process, we'll be more effective. If people would just listen to me, is the, the people's myth. And then the artifacts, which is like, people are not reading my specs, that's why we're not we're not being effective. So if I could go very quickly here is this. The process, if, forget what process you, you, you want to try to, to, to run, although there is evidence that some processes tend to be a little bit more effective than others. I've just been reading, for example, the, chaos, the last chaos report says that either lean or agile, like a variation of Scrum Kanban, tend to be a little bit more effective in terms of the regular traditional waterfall ones, but the reality is, is like, it's, it's not about the process, it's more about how effective you are when it comes to collaboration. Uh, but usually this comes to uh, um, synchron cognitive synchronization, uh, developing shared memories, planning, 
And, and I guess that's the problem with a lot of these processes. People think it's like, oh, if you plan better, then things will just naturally happen, which is not the case most of the times. Um, then there's the, the, the people. You as a designer have to work, make sure that you're collaborating properly with, with people. The artifacts, like how do you produce them, how do you share it with them, and, and then the tools are there to support everything. So let's go in details a little bit deeper. So when it comes to working in a distributed environment, well, actually, this works, and, and, and I'm, I hope I'm not making this is not anything new for anybody here. This, this works on a local, like, team set up environment also. But the idea is this. When you're working with people, what you're trying to do is like, make sure that you have a shared design workspace, that you help people being aware of what everybody else is doing. But you also engage the team so they feel that like, they own whatever it is that, that you're working on, right? But going back to the issue of the cost of collaboration, I think one of the biggest struggle is, this, is the lack of clarity when it comes to roles and responsibilities especially when you're, when you're remote, right? Let's say one of the typical struggle that, I would, that any of my designers would have when I was working in China is like, hey, spec's done. Who needs to get this? And there's like a list of developers with 150 developers and there's product managers, like there's 12 of them and there's a QA. Like who needs to read this, right? So it's like the clarity of who needs to do what was actually hurting more about, let's say, the spec is not clear or the timeline is, 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 is too tight and so forth. So here's a couple of, of things that could be done to improve the way that you collaborate with people. If you've been on Jeff's workshop, he, he, I think he covered a little bit about Design Studio. And basically, I think, I, I think by now everybody's aware of this tech Design Studio approach. But the idea is that you are coming up with a common space that in this case is physical, but it needs to be somewhat virtual if possible, where everybody's coming together and work is being done in a collaborative manner. Space like this is great for casting a vision. And, um, and I'm going I mean, and the, the part of this talk is, has little to do with design itself. It's more about the de design leadership, which I think is a problem that a lot of teams struggle is if people just knew what was the priority of this project or what's that that we're trying to get done, and then they look at things that they need to be done, things would just prioritize themselves. You know, it's like, why are we doing this? Who are we trying to build this for? And then you look at your back backlog, things would just fall into place automatically. But that it takes people to be on the same page and a very good understanding, like a shared vision about what, what is that that you're trying to produce. What, as you can see here in the example, someone is drawing on the board, there's people taking notes of what's being said, and there's people like listening. Um, this particular example, there's like two, uh, two designers, there's a, uh, there's a software development manager, there's two QAs, and there's another software architect here. So you're getting multiple perspectives, and people are all in the same room, and then they're seeing, they're, they're, seeing, they're listening, they're, here, uh, they're smelling sometimes, you know, but, but the idea is like you're getting multiple channels of communication. Uh, I think it's just another example. As you can see here, now there's several conversations going on at the same time, right? So there's a product manager here, so he's like, look at that guy over there. It's like, is that, but, but even that kind of like gossiping and everything, it sometimes, well, unless you're kind of trashing people behind their backs, which your mom probably said you shouldn't, most of the times, like, the informal communications is probably are even more important than the formal communications. So I think uh, Juan Carlos was talking about, let's say, having conversations that is important to, to let's say, how do you get people to act? It usually involves um, having conversations. So the way I see my contribution to a design team is this I'm spending 10% of my time doing design, quote unquote, like writing specs and things like that. And most of the times I'm just communicating, getting people to, to understand something and so forth. So what I, from now on, what I'm gonna, every time I mention architect, uh, sorry, artifacts, let's say specs or, or use case documents, what from now on, at least in this presentation, think about, is not just about the artifact, is about how does that artifact get people to have a conversation around it? So techniques like the six thinking hats is very good for you to, um, to facilitate some of these discussions. 
right? So I, I, I'm, I'm particularly fond of this one technique, but there's others. The idea is like, you need, we just need to get better at facilitating discussions, especially in a, in a, in a group setup. When things are distributed, of course, it's difficult to have um, a common space, or at least a physical common space. That's when technology can be very helpful. Um, so this is a so this is a, a, a telepresence room that we used to use when I was in Shanghai. So this is my friend Sean, his software development manager, and this is the product manager Charlie Crocker in San Francisco. And that we are 16 hours apart, but because the lighting in the room. And the, and the background in, 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 each, in each room on, on opposite sides of the, the Pacific, they all look the same. It gives the impression that everybody's in the same space, right? I'm not suggesting that anybody buys any of these because it's like damn expensive. So, um, but there are alternatives, right? So you can have Google Hangouts. Um, this is John. Is John here? Anyway, but. Um, John is being hanging out in this event, and then now he's also, when he's not doing user research, he does advertising for, for Google. Um, so uh, this is Google Hangouts. I think everybody's familiar with it, right? So um, most of the times, I, I think one way that, I'm, that I, I help my organization in terms of, especially when we're distributed, is not coming up just with specs, but coming up with other artifacts that help people come together. Um, so for example, this is, this is not really a design artifact. This is more like a, a project management artifact, which is a, a RASIC matrix. Um, and this is like basically you're saying, for this particular phase of the process, who's the, who are the stakeholders first? But what are the roles of these stakeholders? Right? Who's responsible? Who is approving? Who's, in, who's informed? Who gets consulted? Because then at any given phase of the process, let's say, oh, the UI spec is done. Who needs to get, who needs to get it, right? So uh, let's say you, UI, the product marketing gets consulted. Either the pro, pro, product management or system architect has to approve. So it removes a lot of this back and forth of like, hey, why did I not get this? Or I got this, but nobody asked my feedback for it. It's like, well, a tool like this could be very helpful. Someone asked me during my workshop, like, but is it worth the going through all this trouble for, uh, for a project? How much time does it take uh, to get something done like this? And my, my, my answer to a question like this is this. I would rather spend whatever it takes to get this clarified now than having to spend the next six months of revisiting the same issue over and over again. But fair enough. Not all organizations have these many departments, and not all organizations are running these many deliverables, especially if you're, in, let's say, doing lean or agile. You're probably cutting short some of these, uh, these artifacts. So you have, to find out, you have to figure out what works best for your organization. What I'm trying to do right now is like, think of the traditional stakeholder interviews. This is like how I am approaching this. Um, I'm, I'm doing a stakeholder interview just to get sure, just to make sure that we get the roles and, and responsibilities clear when it comes to interaction of the different departments. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that you have to do this uh, for every project. If there is unclarity on your projects right now, I would strongly recommend you work with whatever, whoever is the project manager on your team and say, like, hey, do we have a roles and responsibilities matrix or anything? If not, then you need to start pushing to get something like this. How I did it is this. I kind of broke down the high level phases of our projects, and I want to get some information from them so that, let's say, who needs to deliver what to who so that they get their work done. So this is basically a very simple stakeholder interview I'm conducting with each stakeholder of the company. And I'm halfway through this, but it was very revealing. Because you hear people say kind of completely opposites on each department. It's like, hey, they're supposed to do this. It's like, no, they are supposed to do this. So removing that lack of clarity, uh, so sorry, the, yeah, making that go away would make long ways in terms of being more efficient on, on the future. You might be asking, is this, well, what, isn't that the role of a project manager? The answer is yes. Probably, let's say, if you have a good project manager, you should, have this, you, you should get this for free um, most of the times. 
My experience, unfortunately, and, and I don't want to disrespect any project managers out there, is this. A lot of the project managers I've worked with, they are just glorified note takers. You know, it's like, is it on time? Yes, good. See you next week. You know, it's like, you need to, if, if they're not doing this for you, then you need to start pushing. Like, uh, and unfortunately, I was talking to Eric about this earlier. If, if I'm not getting these tools to help me, then I, let's say, if somebody's got the, need to get their act together, and if it helps me to help them, so be it, right? As long as you understand that your specs are not getting done because you're getting other people's shit together, right? So, but if nothing else, um, at least something like a, um, some very basic uh, flow of how your organization is going to work. So let's say there's this expression in Portuguese, a casa de ferreiro, espeta de pau. So like. Uh, the, 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 in the cobbler's house, the children go barefoot. Like, how come you're helping all your customers being more effective? Like, I remember one of the projects I was working is like, yeah, and we're going to help people use our augmented reality to do concept designs of buildings, and yet we're sending things by email or fax, you know, like collaborating internally. Well, why don't we use our own tools to help our own organization to be more efficient? So this was me. Uh, setting up how, how our internal teams would collaborate on different deliverables. Which, well, I guess some designers think, well, this is too computer, like too UML um, oriented. Well, if it, that's what it takes to work with software developers, so be it. Right? So this is just an example. Um, when it comes to the process, and I'm going to share some of I'm going to share some of my experience, which can be very conflicting sometimes with the theory that is out there. And, my, and, and what I've noticed is this. People write a lot about, let's say, computer-supported workspaces and everything. And, and that's all great, but it's so disconnected from re the reality that most people are facing. So what I'm going to, if I'm going to, I'm going to show you some stuff. If you don't agree, you can always come back to me, and we work together, patent it, and then we get shitloads of money by f f suing people for patent infringement. So here, the idea is this. Whatever process you decide to use, here's what I would suggest you do. Think about how does that process help you be on, let's say, how does it foster cognitive synchronization? And it's very technical, right? It's cognitive synchronization. Basically, this, are we? Are we all in the, in, in the same page or the same understanding of what needs to be done, right? Um, um, Jason Fried from 37 Signals, he says, like, we dumped specifications a long time ago because they create the illusion of agreement, right? Well, to some extent, I agree with him, but it's like, I'm, I'm going to show you later that artifacts are useful for many other things. But there is some level of agreement that needs to be reached so that you can even move forward. Because if not, it's like, I think was some of the, was one of the issues that Juan was bringing up is like, some people are not fully there. They are only half percent there because like they are holding these grudges, for example, from the previous project and so forth. So like, how do you get people to be on the same page about anything? Um, the, de help develop shared memories and meaning, planning and so forth. So I'm gonna try to cover this quick because we run out of time. The two major theories about project arrangement or, or planning and, and, and coordination is, is either, I mean, when it comes to some sort of team arrangement, is either one of these two, collaborative and distributed. And collaborative is more like you're trying to get people from multiple perspectives to come together, right? Let's say, this is works, this is, this is I think, maybe, maybe the Scrum or like the Agile manifesto doesn't say, we are supporting collaborative design, but that's what, they, what, that's what is happening. You know, like you're trying to bring everybody together as a team, you're working together, there's a lot of cognitive synchronization. We, fought, we prefer communication over documentation that because they think, that, or they, at least they are hope that everybody's on the same page. Which means that ground and negotiation is kind of the core of that part, right? So of that process. And when it comes to distributed design, it's more about how do we, let's say, we know what needs to be done, you do this part, you do this part, and you do this part. And, and, and it sound, it's going to sound crazy when I say, but this is, people know how to do this really well out there. Maybe not in, 
let's say, if you're coming from Agile, it's a struggle, but let's face it, people have been doing things distributedly very well for many years. So for example, think of the manufacturing industry, car industry, for example. There's a, a very popular car in Europe right now because it's popular in the sense it's cheap, it's called Skoda, which is from, I think it's from um, Poland maybe, or Croatia. And like the pieces, the, mo the, the engine comes from Volkswagen somewhere in, 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 in Croatia and then the, some parts come from China, and, and so you, you, you know this, right? Let's say there's parts are coming from all over and then being assembled somewhere. So people know how to do distributed things very, very well. The problem is that they want to do things distributed, but collaborative is actually more effective when it comes to speed, right? And that's, um, actually, that's the conflict between Agile and the traditional waterfall process, because like from the waterfall, waterfall is very good in doing this, and Agile is very good in doing this, but it's, it's difficult to bridge the two together. So here's, here's what I'm gonna say, well, I guess we covered this already. Collaborative is about establishing common ground, clarifying perspectives and convergence. We're trying to get everybody together. While distributed is about, is the organization aligned, let's say, do the, each department knows what they're doing and each one is working on modular pieces of the work. Right? So that means th knowing what each other is doing is actually more important about than, let's say, the vision and, and, and everything. So here's a couple of proposals of how to, let's say, try to conciliate the two. So you have the different team members, whatever they are, whatever their departments are, it would be good if they were all together to kick off. I think that that's even on, on Jeff's book, he suggests like there's a, Let's say the kickoff, you ha you, everybody's together. Or at least in some, at some stage when synchronization needs to happen, everybody needs to be on the same page, it would be good that everybody's physically in the same place. I showed you that those examples I showed you before of the, the, of the design studio. Actually, none of these people is actually from that city that we were meeting. You know, it's like one person has a home office, the other are two are from China, one is from New York. And we are meeting on the headquarters of the company just for that week, right, to do a design studio session. So we decide, we work together, we create, doc, we, we create a, a common vision, we, we know what we need to do, and then boom, the sprints kick off. I'm suggest, well, in this model, which I'm calling the good night dear, is this guy, make sure that he, the last thing he do before going to bed is like he checks his email and answer questions from people um, uh, before each going to work. So the idea is like there's two distributed teams and there's this guy making sure that the communication is, is working. Sometimes it's the designer, but in other, I've seen a lot of companies, this could be, a, let's say, a product owner or a project manager. This has been very successful in a lot of the uh, outsourcing companies, right? So for example, if you work with Cognizant or Accenture, when they have this offshore development center somewhere in India, usually the project, they budget to have a product manager or a project manager in that location. For example, they, they're in India and then the project is being doing from some company in Chicago. They send someone there and the guy sits in that office and then he does the emails at late at night. He speaks the same language, he understands the culture and, and everything. And we're gonna have to run a little faster here. The second model um, is what I call designers that never sleep. So the, it's a little variation of the first in the sense that let's say you have kickoff and you're working together, everybody, but then you have one designer or, or one sync up person on each team and then they talk to each other and then they let their team know, right? This is a, a method that I actually used for a few years because then you leverage on the, on the capability of each team. So for example, one designer could be close to the product manager and the software architects in one location, and I could be in, in Shanghai close to the people that is actually building these things. So instead of everybody needs to be in one big scrum meeting and everybody's answering questions and asking things, no, it's just like those two guys sync up and then they, they sync up with their own teams. And you might be wondering, well, but from a communication perspective, doesn't it create a bottleneck? Totally, yeah. Absolutely, completely bottleneck. So that means that these two guys need to be super, super sharp. They need to understand how to get communication together and so forth. 
the next um, the next approach is uh, uh, yet another variation is what I call the, the strike team approach which is here's the kickoff we're getting some work done collaboratively but then there's a spin-off of a team as you can see they have they're coming from different backgrounds and they're working on what I, what I think this is this concept of sprint zero is very popular already right let's say Someone, a smaller team, works on getting prototypes ready. They, they test with the customers. They do a lot of initial investigation to make sure that, let's say, for example, this phase could be validating a hypothesis. Once that is done to, to the degree of certainty that, we can, that can be done, then the, the rest of the, the, the guys join on a sprint. Because what that in here we could be generating user stories, we could breaking up things into epics and, and everything, so that these other things can even happen. Right? Does that make sense? Um, the third approach is more like I, I well, if you're in, in um, comics, I think like the best way I could describe this is like the silver server approach, which is is a variation of the first in the sense of let's say there's a kickoff, everybody's together, then there's this, the strike team working on every sprint, one sprint ahead of the other. So let's say they work on sprint one, do a lot of prototyping, then they move on to the next thing, sprint two, while these guys are actually working on sprint one. Right? So the idea is like, it's a variation of a stage-based development. So I'm calling this Silver Surfer in a sense, let's say he's going ahead of figuring things out before the, before the team this behind actually needs to build this. So it's not like they're going ahead in a sense of, let's say, which planet uh, is, is going to be destroyed next. It's more like, what are the problems that need to be addressed? So by the time that these guys need to start working, they already got um, any information from this team before. Right? So, and by the way, these are just my suggestions. If you, I mean, I'll be more than happy to discuss any of that after, afterwards. So. Um, so let's talk about artifacts a little, a little bit. Uh, like I said um, before, so then what is the role of the artifacts? It, well, if you're, in, if you're doing Agile for a while, some of the Agile methods are actually very radical in the sense, let's say, we don't need artifacts at all. Well, that, I mean, that assumption it works fine if everybody's in the same location. If people are distributed, in the case, for example, the, the, the designers that never sleep approach, when people are, let's say, 16 hours away, you cannot have the conversations. It's just a fact. Uh, unless, well, you can have a conversation as long as one person throws the work-life balance away because like, I'm having meetings three nights a week at 2 o'clock in the morning. So, they, so, if, so the idea is like good collaboration methods distributedly would involve some level of asynchrony. Asynchrony. Oh, sounds like a police album. But the idea is like you put an, uh, the, uh, an artifact there and someone on his own time could read it, um, whatever is convenient for them. Do not mix this with the traditional waterfall process when you like, just throw over the wall and someone picks it up. It's more like, can we generate artifacts that could generate the discussion, some of those discussions happening asynchron asynchronously. Sorry, I'm not a native English speaker, so it's, sometimes it's hard for me to do. But basically, and you're also supporting with metadata, right? So traditional... Um, Traditional specification is very good to communicate the design intent, right? This is how it's going to work. But what I notice working with stakeholders is, is they care more about why. I mean, how does this piece of UI is going to help me achieve my business goals and so forth? How does it help us drive this particular channel in the service? And of course, there's always the, the challenge of, let's say, low fidelity versus high fidelity. So let me show you a couple of artifacts that I view, I've created in the past to help people uh, work asynchronously, come up with some sort of, actually it's not just a matter of asynchronously, it's more about like how do we get people to make decisions, right? So first one is, this was an a analytics tool that I was working on a prototype with some developers. The idea is this, we're working on this big ass desktop application and we have tons of, meta, of, of analytics, of, um, lots of data about where people click. Right? They click on this command and they do this command. So why not be able just like visualize this in a way that you could, let's say, what are the commands that are closer by most used and which commands are closer to each other? 
these kind of things, let's say, could be done asynchronously, could be done automatically by some sort of data mining. These are great for working with teams distributedly. But the artifact itself doesn't tell you anything. It's just a tool for you to have a conversation with whoever needs to make a decision about it. Right? Same thing here. So this is a, a asymmetric clustering matrix, which is, which is a great tool. Let's say if you're doing the traditional affinity diagram, which, by the way, I love those. But the fact is, like, someone needs to be physically there moving the post-its around. So what we tried in a couple of projects is, like, we put, a, a, we put in sites. Each insight is a line, and there's another, uh, uh, like, rows and columns of insights. So basically, th what this is doing is a pairwise analysis, right? If an insight is closer to the other one, let's rank it, let's rank it three. If it's not close, let's rank it one. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing clusters uh, appearing. And by the way, none of these artifacts, if I just remove the context, if I, just, um, if I don't tell the story or I'm not walking people through it, most of these artifacts will be just useless, right? Don't expect people to do the math and come up with their own conclusions about any of this. The last one I'm going to show is this one. It, this is like a UXI matrix. Here you have the use cases, and here you have the personas. So you're kind of helping people see what is the impact on a particular use case on the personas, right? So for example, modify application layout is a use case that every person across the board is going to need it. Well, guess what? Maybe from a design perspective, we want to spend more time on that one instead of uh, assigning user roles, which only the application administrator use. And by the way, I'm not a genius. I didn't create this. This is the work of, of John Innes, is a consultant out of San Francisco. I, I, I strongly recommend you guys visit this. Basically, is a is a is a backlog on asteroids. So it's like you 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 build more information, you put more information, more context on the top of of the backlog. Um, there's even how much uh, what is a dev estimation in terms of story points and everything. So you could. Again, it's not about the number. It's not about the values. It's more about what kinds of conversations you can have with other people on this. And we're kind of running out of time, so let's move on. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is tools. And, and let's say, if I'm, if I'm a, a, a user generating the requirements for tools, this would be a very bad way to describe it. Like The tools should just take care of everything else. So if you're working on, on creating the tools to support this, I'll, I'll be a little bit more descriptive. So, a tool should help you like, create these shared work, uh, workspaces, support this cognitive synchronization, you know, like develop shared memories and meaning, help you transition from low fidelity to high fidelity. So it would be good that there, was, there would be one tool that did all this. Of course, there isn't. So what I suggested during the workshop is this. If there's not one tool that's going to do all this, can you at least pick up a, come up with a workflow of First tool is going to do this, and this is how it's going to fit into the next, and this is how it's going to fit into the next. So what I'm going to show you is a couple of examples of tools that I, I came across recently. This is Hiveflux, developed by our friends in, in um, uh, Bruno Figueiredo from, from Lisbon. Basically, is this, uh, when it comes to raising awareness of people's activities, this is great. It's like in one page, you're seeing what everybody else is working. But like I said, the, the, the awareness of work is just a very small piece on the whole puzzle, right? So this is good for, to, to cover one part of the workflow. This other, I guess some of you are familiar, this is Morley, which is great for capturing the artifacts that get produced, for example, during user research. Because one challenge I've noticed a lot is like, OK, d great, I've done all these post-its. How do I carry to the next off? Which is, by the way, is a problem I experienced a couple months ago. I finished the, 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 the contextual inquiry uh, node capturing, and then I have to fly next day to Dubai. I didn't have time to scan, no time to pack things up, so put it on a butcher paper, roll it up, put it under my, my, the armpit, and just hops in the plane, and then you're in Dubai. This can only do, there's, there's only so much of that that can be done, right? Ideally, everything should be digital, so that's why tools like this, Morley, is very good. Um, What it would be great if that if all these tools would came together, you know, if it's not one tool that's going to do everything, if there was at least some way to collaborate, you know, like for example, from Hive Flux, you could 
let's say, Hyflux could read from Jira all the user stories, and then Jira would, would connect to Morley so that you can actually see the artifacts. So um, the idea is that it would be great if the workflow, if, like, if it's not going to be all in one tool, at least the workflow is like you figure out how does that work best for um, each tool. And, I, and with that, um, I, I mean, at least my suggestions are done. So thank you very much. <laughs>